Hello, everyone, and welcome to MOS Live. My name is Sarah, my pronouns are she and her, and I'll be your moderator today for our show about live animals. If you would like to see closed captions, you can press the CC button at the bottom of your screen and select show captions. If you would like to answer a question or ask a question today, you can press the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in your question. If you would like a shout out, you can leave your name and age. Thank you to everyone who's watching on Facebook or YouTube, but unfortunately we can't see your questions and comments from there. And so now I'd like to introduce our live animal and our animal friends keeper. Hi everyone, my name is Corey. I'm the invertebrate keeper here at the Museum of Science. And with me today is Liz, who is the assistant curator of the Live Animal Center. So today we are gonna be looking at animals that live here in New England. Um, so we're gonna be looking at a wide range of animals and we're gonna be talking a little bit about what these animals are doing during the winter time. So the first animal that we're gonna bring out is an invertebrate, is an insect and is really hard to spot. So Liz already has our camera up and going so you can see one is moving around right now. You might already have some guesses but these are North American walking sticks or also called common walking sticks. So the one right here that's gonna give Liz a run for her money with the camera is the, um, our male. So he's a little bit smaller than the female um, who is nicely sitting up on the other side of the enclosure. So Northern walking sticks can be found pretty much anywhere from Florida all the way up to Canada. Um, as of when we're in colder areas, their lifespan is a little bit shorter than when they're in warmer areas. So here in New England, our northern walking sticks really depend on the climate. So their entire life cycle depends on the temperature outside. They are waiting for those environmental cues to tell them when they should lay eggs, when they should mate, and how long they're going to live for. So northern walking sticks, they pretty much live until the first frost. So that can be anywhere from four months to six months to seven months, depending on where they live. Um, uh, what's really cool about these guys is we can see the difference between the males and the females, like I had mentioned before. So the males are a little bit smaller. Um, they have brightly colored striped legs. Um, they're a little more green and the females are gonna be more of a solid color and they do have a little bit of green to them as well. So these guys will actually lay eggs. The females will lay eggs in the fall and they overwinter in those eggs down tucked in a leaf litter where they can stay a little bit more protected. And then once summer, uh, once spring comes around and the temperatures warm up, they're waiting for um, their, the foliage that they eat to come out so then the babies will have lots of food to eat. So they'll come out and they'll start eating all the plant material. So these guys are herbivores, so they only eat plant material, um, but these guys, they use that camouflage to blend in with the plant material, so that way predators have a hard time getting to them. Birds are going to be one of their main predators. They love to eat these guys. They make a really great little snack. And our northern walking stick is a really great example of what invertebrates and insects in our area do during the winter. They have to find some stage of their life that they can overwinter in. So for a lot of insects, that's being in their egg stage. As an egg, they have a little bit more protection um, and they're able to do that overwintering. What also makes it a little bit challenging to find northern walking sticks is that in our area, they actually alternate years that they come out of their eggs. So one year you might have a ton of Northern walking sticks and the next year you might not have any at all. And that is just because they are rotating through a cycle. Um, whereas in the South uh, or the Southern states, they actually will lay eggs and the eggs will come out every single year. So I'm gonna turn it over and see if we have any questions about our little stick insects. Yeah, so our first question is from Lillian, age eight. Does it have a name? Great question. So these guys do not have names. Um, currently, I have about 20 of these guys. 
So uh, they all look very, very similar. So they do not have names, but that's a great question. Um, both of these are just about three months old. Um, they're three to four months. That's usually how long it takes them to reach adulthood. So they're still pretty young. And because we're in a nice warm building in the museum, they're actually going to live for a pretty long time. So though I expect them to be adults um, in their adult stage and live for another um, five to six months. All right, Sophie, age 11, and Maddie want to know how many eggs do they lay or how many can they lay at a time? That's a wonderful question. So uh, these guys lay one egg at a time. Um, the amount of eggs that they can lay is not really known. Um, Northern walking sticks are, their population's actually pretty good. We're not too worried at this point in time about their population, although climate change is gonna have a huge, huge impact on them because they rely so much on those environmental cues to go into their, their life stage. Um, and now Sarah, I've totally, since I sidetracked, forgotten what the actual question was. Um, do you mind reminding me? Yeah, it was how many eggs do they lay? at one time and in total? Yes, yes, wonderful question. So um, we really don't know a ton about, about that. Um, it's harder to kind of find them. And when they are in groups, they it is hard to tell which female laid how many. So it is, a, it is a little tricky for us to know that exact information, but that's a wonderful question. Emily and Juliet want to know, what do their eggs look like? If they spend their winters in leaf litter, can we accidentally disturb them when we rake or leaf blow? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. So their eggs are incredibly tiny. Um, they are almost, they're probably the size, if you had um, like a needle, they're going to be similar to the size of like the eye of the needle. So they're really, really small. They're black with white, uh, with a white outlining on the side. And you really, you would have to really dig through the leaf litter and know exactly what you're looking for to see them. Um, when I show people their eggs here at the museum, people are, their minds are just blown because they're so, so tiny. But that also plays to their advantage that they're able to, when we rake or when we step on leaves, they're able to sink down into the ground and kind of fall into those crevices. So, um, of course, we, we, you know, if we are raking or doing those things, we can be disturbing those eggs, but that's okay. They're really small. You know, they're meant to be hardier because they are on the ground and it's not just humans. There are other animals walking around too that can step on them as well. But again, because of their size, they're able to kind of dig their way into little crevices to be safe. Watson, age 11, wants to know, are they poisonous? Ooh, wonderful question. So um, these guys are not poisonous. They, uh, that's why they have that really amazing camouflage. Um, they really stay very, very still. They don't move around a lot. And they have to do that because again, they're, their only defense is blending in and they make a really great snack for a nice bird. Um, a lot of people wanna know what specifically they eat or what specific plant they eat. Yeah, so these guys do have a wider variety that they that they will eat, but one of their favorites is black oak. So that is their ultimate favorite. And they will, um, if you have a high population, they will take down an entire tree in a summer. You do have to have a very high population to do that, um, but it has been observed happening. Um, a lot of people are asking how long do they get and how long do they live? Great question. So the males, uh, the boys, they are about 75 millimeters and the females are about 90 millimeters. So for reference, the size of my finger is the max length of the, uh, of the male and the female is just a little bit longer. So they're really small. So most people, when um, they see walking sticks out in the wild, they're normally like on their screen porch or on their tables out back. It's really, really hard to see these guys in the wild because they blend in so well and they're so small. They're just these little tiny things and they blend in with the veins of the trees. So it is hard to see them. Uh, lifespan wise, they do come out in the summer. It takes them about four months um, 
it takes them about four months to reach adulthood and then they'll live another again it depends on when the first frost is so it could be anywhere from another three to six months depending on their location so again these animals are going to be really highly impacted uh, by climate change so if in March we have a really really warm week these guys might be triggered to come out of their of their eggs and then we have another storm after that they'll all freeze and die and we'll lose a whole generation of walking sticks so these guys are super dependent their life cycle on um on our on our climate all right and for our last question on this animal Nirla age 10 and Isabel age 5 want to know why do they look like a stick that's a great question. So that is their camouflage. So walking sticks are uh, is kind of a common name for a larger group of what are called phasmids. And that is a group of animals that look like sticks or that they use a defense mechanism to blend in with plants. So these guys, they do that because again, they're just herbivores. So they're just eating plant material. They don't have teeth like we do. The best way for them to protect themselves is to camouflage with their environment because like I've said before, they make a very, very easy and tasty snack for uh, any predators. All right, awesome. Well, I am going to share my screen of some more facts about the walking stick. Um, this should help. We had some questions about the location, some more about the food and lifespan. Um, so feel free to take a picture of this, screenshot it, take a picture with something else so you can learn a little bit more about our walking stick. Hi everyone, I'm Liz, as Corey said, and we are just about ready to meet our next animal, which is a New England reptile. So I don't know what you guys first think of when you hear reptile, but snakes are an example of reptiles. And I personally love snakes. So hopefully a lot of you do as well. Now this New England snake is called an Eastern milk snake. And they do live in a lot of the eastern parts of the United States, as their name would suggest. Now, of our New England snakes, there's actually 14 total species that live in Massachusetts. A lot of times people are surprised that we have that many different kinds of snakes here in Massachusetts. I would say eastern milk snakes are probably one of the more common ones that people actually see. Eastern milk snakes and then garter snakes are probably the number one most common snake that people tend to see. Garter snakes look very different from this. I'm sure some of you have seen them before. They're very dark in color and they have long yellow bands running all down the sides of their body. So garter snakes are very easy to identify, but maybe some of you have been lucky enough to see an Eastern milk snake as well. Now, Eastern milk snakes often live in areas where people are. So they're just common to see. They're often in your own backyard. They actually often turn up in places like barns. Believe it or not, that's why they got that name milk snake. Farmers often would find them in barns and they actually for a long time believed these snakes were drinking milk from cows. We know now that that's pretty silly and that's not why the snakes were hanging out in barns. Um, they actually hang out in barns because lots of animals they like to eat might also be hanging out in barns. But the name milk snake did stick for that reason. Uh, actually not uncommon to find these snakes uh, in some woods. If you're out for a hike or anything like that, you will often see them. But like I said, you can't even find them in your own backyard. And a lot of times people don't really like this. Sometimes these snakes have been known to wander in your basement. Now, I know a lot of people don't like to think of a snake coming into their house, but they are harmless. This is an example of a non-venomous snake species. And you could think of it that they might be doing you a favor, getting rid of mice that might be in your basement. Uh, again, I know you might not necessarily want one in your house, um, but they are a completely harmless snake. So they are non-venomous. They are actually a type of constrictor. 
Like boas and pythons, they do squeeze their prey in order to kill. Now, Eastern milk snakes are often mistaken for venomous snakes. We actually have two venomous snake species here in Massachusetts. One is the timber rattlesnake, one is the northern copperhead. And they do look pretty different. If you happen to come across a lot of snakes, you might want to look up some images of these different kinds of snakes. Those venomous ones that I mentioned are extremely rare. They're actually technically endangered in the state of Massachusetts. So it is highly unlikely that you would come across a venomous snake. But sometimes Eastern milk snakes, unfortunately, are killed because people do think they are one of those venomous snakes. And I think I'll turn it over and see if we have any questions for this one, Sarah. Oh yes, we have lots of questions coming in. Um, you definitely answered the first question about are they poisonous or venomous? Um, so let's go to Vivian, age nine. What is the name and age of this animal? This snake is actually getting older. It's about 16 years old is our best estimate. We actually don't know the exact age of this snake. It was an adult when we got it. Uh, and the name of the snake is Burgundy. Uh, Alexandra and Lillian, age eight, want to know what does it eat? So snakes are carnivores. That means they eat meat and only meat. Here at the museum, this snake eats mice. We do feed him mice that are already dead. Uh, sometimes that makes people feel a little bit better about it. In the wild, their diet would be pretty varied. Um, milk snakes are actually also known, in addition to rodents, they also eat other snakes, which is kind of neat. Not too many snakes are known to eat other snakes regularly. Milk snakes and king snakes are examples of snakes that do that. So pretty much any small animal they're going to be able to find. Definitely rodents, things like mice would be big ones. But pretty much anything they're able to get a hold of in their mouth and constrict to kill it, they're going to try to eat, as long as it's another animal. All right, we're getting a great shot of the tongue and Maria, age four, wants to know how long is their tongue? So I think you're getting a pretty good glimpse of just how long it is. Oh, that was perfect, right on <laughs> you there. Probably extending from his mouth, I would say it's a solid inch coming out. Uh, it's not like he holds his tongue out like we can so you could measure it, but it is a pretty long tongue. A snake tongue is very important. They actually use their tongue to help them smell. So every time he's flicking out that tongue, he's collecting little scent molecules in the air and then pressing those molecules to the roof of his mouth where he has something called the Jacobson's organ. This is telling his brain what he's smelling. So I actually don't think he's ever been in the classroom where we are right now. So he's probably picking up on lots of interesting smells. You can really see he was doing a lot of that tongue flicking for quite a while. I guess he's decided he knows uh, what's around at this point. Uh, Gus, age six, wants to know how long do they grow? They're a relatively small species of snake. Uh, you can see, I mean, probably get a rough idea of his length just in uh, how much space he's taking up in Corey's hands. They generally get somewhere between two tops, four feet in length, which sometimes I even say that and that seems really long to people. But this snake is easily three feet in length, um, but they're relatively slender, probably about a little thicker than maybe your thumb. Um, so they are, again, a relatively small snake. Oops, Baron, age 10, and Isabel, age five, want to know if you can have a milk snake as a pet. So generally you can't have native wildlife, so something that lives natively here in your state as a pet. That's just kind of a general rule for the most part. Um, there are other species of milk snakes, so ones not exactly like this one, that you can have as a pet. Um, for example, Pueblin milk snakes, Sinaloan milk snake, kind of other species of milk snakes, but you cannot have an eastern milk snake as a pet. Uh, in Massachusetts or New Hampshire where they are native. All right, so 
A lot of people are asking um, what you should do if you encounter the snake in nature. How does the snake act? How should you act? And can you touch it? That's actually a great question. And I meant to talk about that. So I'm really glad people brought that up. Uh, generally, snakes are pretty shy and secretive in the wild. The best thing to do is just look at them from a distance and think to yourself, wow, cool, I just saw an Eastern milk snake or a garter snake and just leave it alone. Don't try to touch it. This particular snake is what we call an ambassador animal at the museum. He's used to doing programs. He's really used to being handled. If you tried to grab a snake out in the wild, it would not behave this nicely. Honestly, it would be pretty terrified. If you grab a snake and it's not used to being handled, it's going to think you're going to hurt it. So chances are wild snakes, if you do try to grab them, will try and bite. So it's best to just appreciate them from a distance, leave them alone and let them be on their way. All right, our last question. Uh, Caddy, age seven, wants to know how many of these snakes are in the wild? So they, as a species, are what we call a species of least concern. And I know that sounds kind of mean because it sounds like we don't care about them, but they are common. They are not endangered at all. Their numbers are doing quite well. So I don't have the latest. I would have to look it up on Mass Fish and Wildlife to see the latest census if they have an idea of how many are in the wild. But there are lots of them. <laughs> so that's the kind of the best answer I can give you right now. We're not concerned of them becoming endangered at any point soon. All right, so I'm gonna put up some more facts about the um, milk snake. So feel free to look at this. This should answer a lot of the questions we had. Um, so take a picture and get your milk snake facts. So while Corey is getting our camera ready, I'm really excited for you guys to meet this next animal. This is an animal, it's a mammal that is very common in New England. However, the one we're going to show you might look a little different than ones you're used to seeing. So with that being said, we'll have Corey turn our camera on and you guys can get a glimpse at our mammal. So this is an Eastern gray squirrel. I'm sure you guys have seen squirrels all the time. Maybe you even saw one today. They actually don't truly hibernate. So you might even see them, even though they hunker down and try to kind of conserve energy in the winter, they don't truly hibernate. So they are active year round. Now here in New England, we have a couple tree squirrels. Gray squirrels are one example. We also have a couple species of flying squirrels and red squirrels. Also, for a little bit of trivia, we have some ground squirrels in New England. Chipmunks are in the squirrel family. Also, woodchucks, which are also known as groundhogs, are in that squirrel family as well. Now, gray squirrels are excellent climbers. You might get to see ours climbing a little bit here in the enclosure that she's in right now. They're actually one of the few mammals that can climb down a tree head first. They have some really cool adaptations with their paws that enable them to do that. Another thing you might see our squirrel do while she's in this enclosure is something called caching or making a cache. So squirrels hide food. Now they do this because they know they're gonna need to survive cold winters. So they leave themselves lots of stashes of food and they have pretty good spatial memory to remember where all those caches are. Now I've been calling this animal a gray squirrel. You guys are probably looking at her going, okay, she's calling it gray, but it's, a, it's white. Why is she calling it a gray squirrel? Now the species is a genetic mutation that is called albinism, or you would say an animal is an albino. Now things called pigments give us color, give our hair color, our eyes color. When things are lacking pigment, there's no pigment, we call that albino. So typically an albino animal will have white fur and then a good clue is you will see red eyes. 
Now, that's because you're not seeing pigment. There's no color that you're seeing in the eye. So you're actually seeing the blood vessels. Now, our white gray squirrel, you might notice a couple things. She does have some color. You just got a very quick glimpse at her eyes. Her eyes are dark, so they're not red like those albinos. She also has some color in her fur. Notice some flecks of black at her tail. So she has a slightly different genetic mutation that is called leucism. So she has very reduced pigment. She still has some pigment, but she just doesn't have as much pigment as the gray squirrels you're used to seeing, which is kind of neat. Now, chances are in the wild, a leucistic or an albino gray squirrel would have a harder time surviving. If you think about it, these animals are gonna stand out more to predators. Things are going to be able to find them a little bit easier. Fortunately for our Eastern gray squirrel, she was actually orphaned as a young baby during a hurricane and she was taken in and kind of nursed back to health and to maturity by us here at the museum. And she's too used to being with people. So she now has a nice important job as an ambassador with us here at the museum. Now, I know we only have a couple minutes left. So why don't I turn it over to some questions, Sarah? Yeah, so a lot of love for the squirrel in the comments. Oh, um, that's great. <laughs> so a lot of people wanna know what is the name and age of the squirrel? So our squirrel's name is Storm. She was actually orphaned during Hurricane Irene, I believe nine years ago. So she is nine years old. People are often surprised that squirrels can live that long. They're known to live 20 years in captivity. So a lot of people are wondering why there is paper or trash in the enclosure right now. <laughs> it does kind of look like trash. When I set it up, it seemed really fun. I wanted to give her things to do while she was in there. So those little paper towels, ooh, she's going over to one right now when I'm talking about it. They have little bits of food wrapped up in them. So it's like a little packet she has to tear open to get to the treat. She has a paper bag in there that had some Cheerios. Those are an extra special treat for her. She has a little puzzle feeder. It's kind of that like bluish thing that you see on the floor of the enclosure. That had lots of different food treats. I think she's found most of them. It's kind of like, uh, so she has to work at it to get it. Um, we have to keep her mind active and give her lots of things to, uh, to do while she's in this enclosure. Uh, so yeah, I guess it does kind of look like trash, but it's her entertainment. All right, and our last question for the day. Um, a lot of people wanna know how big the squirrels get. Is this how big it gets? Um, someone said that red squirrels seem smaller. Is that accurate that they're smaller than a gray squirrel? Red squirrels, they do have a slightly different shape and they are generally a little bit smaller. Uh, Eastern gray squirrels, if you see a really fat one that's put on some weight getting ready for uh, winter, you might see them a little over a pound. So they're relatively small animals. Um, sometimes people think she looks big. I think seeing her close up on the camera, you're used to seeing them run across the street or run up a tree really fast. Um, but she's pretty average sized. Uh, males are usually a little bit bigger. All right, well, thank you so much. We have a ton of questions that are unanswered. So many people are interested in these animals. Um, so thank you so much. And everyone wave goodbye to our animal today. Bye guys. We do have some more fun facts about the gray squirrel uh, named Storm. So here's more about the location, food, lifespan, and cool facts if you would like to quickly take a picture of this. And thank you all today for joining us. You had amazing questions and we're great observers and scientists. Um, so if you liked today's program, you can support the museum by visiting engage.mos.org slash welcome. And if you'd like to see all of our virtual offerings, you can head to mos.org slash mos at home. So thank you everyone. Happy Friday and have a great weekend.